All right, here we go in three, two, and one. Hello, everyone, and welcome back once again to the Great Scott Podcast. Today, I am joined by the former queen of mean, actually, now she's a lovable queen, Miss Lisa Lampanelli. Hi, hey. Lisa. Hey, Michael, how are you? I'm great. Uh, I am such a huge fan. I've loved your work. And uh, I want to say, first off, thank you for doing what you did to Westboro. Oh, my God. Well, if people aren't familiar, I will give them a brief recap. And by the way, you're welcome. Uh, the <laughs> Westboro Baptist Church is a hateful group of people who decided they're going to protest anyone who has gay fans. And since I always had a lot of gay fans, I was like, you know what? When they protest me, I'm going to donate $1,000 for every protester who shows up. Michael, here I am thinking 20 will show up at the most. 48 come. And I think, <laughs> you know what? Even though it sucks to write that check, it's going to a good organization to the gay men's health crisis. So there it goes. 50 grand from Lisa Lampanelli, hero to the gays. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, now that you mentioned that, that was actually the charity you played for on The, the Apprentice as well. Yeah, Celebrity Apprentice, I think it was season five. Um, they have to approve all charities. I didn't know that. And I was so happy because, you know, if they had to push back, I would have been like, okay, you're fired. Yeah. So it's like, okay, yeah. And it was really cool to like, you know, really be behind a charity for such a good, good long time. And I see you have your furry friend down there. Oh my, here's one of them, Parker. Yeah. Hi, Parker. Yes, yeah, named after Sarah Jessica Parker. That's right. He's uh, literally the neediest adoptee ever. And his sister, <laughs> Becky, who is so not needy, is back there and doesn't couldn't care less about me, which I'm like, okay, girl, you need to be <laughs> off. So yes, he's a good boy. Absolutely. Well, uh, anyways, so Lisa, I've kind of gotten into the world of stand-up myself, been doing that for about two and a half years. Right. It's the most fun thing that I've ever done. Yay. And uh, and I want to talk about um, you as a insult comic. Um, so it was a heckler that kind of helped you get into being a stand-up comic. And then it was later on that night that you went home and you wrote down a bunch of uh, comebacks. Yes, yes. So what happened was I was doing just regular old comedy for like a few months. You know, luckily I had taken a comedy class to figure out how to put together five minutes. Because, you know, you just don't go up there and ramble. You have to have some material. Right, right. So I had taken this great class. And I was like, okay. So went good for the first, like, four times. Actually, the fifth time, even with this heckling incident, it, was, it went well. But unfortunately, when I got off stage, the guy after me was bombing so bad that someone <laughs> in the back yelled, hey, this guy sucks. Bring back the fat chick. <laughs> and at the time I had so much shame about weight and, you know, I wasn't at my all time highest, but, you know, I was definitely what people would consider fat. And of course, if I had had self-esteem, I would have heard the bring back part, like, hey, she's good. Instead, all I heard was the fat part. And as you know, fat is the worst, most insulting word ever. You know, we feel like we could still throw it around a lot. So, yeah, yeah. I just went home and after my hurt feelings healed a tiny bit. I just started writing insults if in case that happened again. So are you surprised that uh, later on that night that it became this whole thing with you doing the insult? I guess it's like surprising, except I had asked a guy once, uh, a comic uh, comedy teacher, I said, you know, like, do you know, do I have it all, have to have it all figured out early on? And he's like, no, nobody ends up where they started. So you yeah. can't say to your, like Roseanne probably didn't say in the beginning, oh, I'm going to become the you know domestic goddess or whatever. Like you don't kind of think of those things. You just notice your progression and see how it goes and go, oh, that's cute. Like I remember in, in the old days, we would have like cassette players in our cars and I'd listen to my sets after and the only stuff I'd be laughing at would be the crowd work. And I'm like, oh, yeah. well, that's, if I notice my life, that's what I should be doing. And that's the problem. We get on autopilot with life a lot and just keep going and forget to notice anything, which why, which is why when I talk about retiring a few years ago, I noticed I didn't like how life was going. So instead of just getting on another plane and doing another gig, I'm like, huh, let's think about this, you know? So yeah. when I noticed that I should be doing crowd work, and I noticed when I should get out of it too. And it took you 20 years before you nailed down the insult. 
well, uh, doing the insult? Really, not really. Um, I it took me very short time. Oh, okay. Uh, because what happened was it took me a while to get on the roast because oh, gotcha. okay. once again you have no control over networks. That's the thing. We're really powerless. Um, and the biggest thing you can feel powerless against is a network, you know, because <laughs> they switch on or they don't have to. So um, what was cool was that, uh, thank God, I don't know how this happened, but the Friars Club in New York City just fell in love with me. They had seen me at a show and I got so lucky. They pushed Comedy Central to put me on the Chevy Chase roast. And I was like, oh my God, this is my shot. So yeah, it took probably 10 years to get on there. But then, um, you know, I kind of just, it kind of took off, thank goodness. And then Paul Schaefer was the uh, roast master that night. Yeah, oh my God, he was great. And the thing about Paul Schaefer is, He's the roast master and the roast master has to be able to take a joke. Yeah. So what was good is because you hit them first, you know, um, you know, cause I said to him, you know, Paul Schaefer, every time I look at you, it reminds me to go home and clean my dildo. <laughs> like it, it's like, if they're, if you get them on that first laugh, then it's pretty hard to lose them unless <laughs> yeah. you hear the situation or someone like that who just doesn't prepare and sucks. So did you ever go ever uh did anybody ever come up to you after the roast saying hey lisa or maybe even not a part of the roast when you were insulting did anybody come up to you and say that was a little harsh or did you go um cross the line with anybody well i mean i since i don't think there's a line except your own moral compass um no one would say that because it's kind of imaginary construct but i mean the occasional person would be like you know you were too mean to my friend or you were too mean to the person on The Apprentice or you do, and you just go, oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. You know, as long as they say it nicely, I don't care. Like I'm yeah. the type even now, like I've said publicly, like now that I'm retired, I'm like, well, if I'm, if I hurt your feelings, feel free to get in touch with me and we could talk about it one-on-one, -on -one, you know? And I think yeah. that's great. There's no reason not to say, I'm sorry if someone got hurt. But I'm the roast, I think most people kind of know what they're getting. So they yeah. kind of really don't say anything after. Is there a waiver that they ever have to sign saying, hey, I won't be offended at all? Uh, no, what they have, you know, there, there's like when you sign up to be the roasty, like, a, you know, when Flavor Flavor or David Hasselhoff, they're allowed to like say a couple subjects you can't go after, which I respect that. That's fine. I mean, it's it's they get to have their boundaries and stuff so um you know yeah. like for instance William Shatner you couldn't make fun of that his wife was found dead in a pool uh Trump you couldn't make fun of that he like had tons of bankruptcies and things so it's just things that they would get you know off limits and I was like I'm not gonna waste my time doing those jokes because they're not gonna make it onto air anyway so what am I wasting my time for yeah so I just thought it was weird that some comics wouldn't play by the rules because I'm like what did that get you I was always about business like let's get this on the air let's make it happen absolutely and you roasted Trump not once but twice I know I know right in the first actually both times he was a good sport because it was before you know anything political it was before you know he kind of didn't have a sense of humor anymore so I mean those were fun and also he could take a joke back then it was pretty amazing and that's how I got on Celebrity Apprentice because he was like, oh, she's funny, you know, have her on there. So it worked for me. It wouldn't work for me now, but it worked for me back then. You said that uh, Celebrity Apprentice was the single most hardest thing that you've ever done. Because you guys, physically, yeah. emotionally and mentally exhausting. The problem is like Dancing with the Stars is probably is horribly hard on you physically and probably emotionally because it's sad if you get fired or kicked off or whatever. Right. But like the teams are cheering for each other. Like you don't see like the uh, either, you know, any of the dancers being shifty or being behind people's backs. They're, they're like happy for everybody who kills it. But like freaking apprentice, you're out to get everybody. So I hate that dynamic anyway, but I went in full bore cause I'm like, screw it. Like, I'm just going to do this thing. And I want to show that comics aren't stupid. So I don't know if I did that, but I definitely proved we could stay on long enough if we fight. You certainly did, absolutely. And uh, Don Jr. was a uh, your ally. He was kind of a, a mentor. 
Yeah, I'm glad I met all those guys before they went off the rails and became mental patients and, <laughs> crazy and like not right morally with the world. So yeah, it's like, I, it's almost like I squeaked in before the insanity started. Yeah, I'll, I'll say so. Yeah. But anyways, um, I loved uh, that Trump roast and uh, Seth MacFarlane really went after Trump and uh, so did Jeff Ross. I think those yeah. two probably hit the hardest with, yeah, with Trump. Yeah. Yeah, I really like them both. And I just think Jeff, what I always liked about Jeff was he and I were friendly, very friendly, but that's why you can go after somebody really hard because you're friends with them. So anytime he said anything horrible and I said anything horrible, we both kind of winked and we're like, yeah, you know, I'm kidding, right? <laughs> yeah. You know? So he was always the best. There was a, Jeff said something, I think this was at the Hasselhoff roast and he just looks over at you and you were bigger than, he yeah. said, there she is looking as beautiful as never. Yeah, I mean, these are clever jokes. That's why I never had feelings hurt over jokes if they're clever. Yeah. Like, I mean, I love a good joke directed at me because guess what? It's funny and you get, <laughs> yeah. to laugh. you get to be on screen laughing, which is badass because it's more staged than screen time. You know, people don't get the more you take the jokes and look like you're having fun, which most of the time you are like freaking you sell more tickets to your shows. Yeah. Like, don't get all angry because then people hate you. You know, like Andy Dick used to always, I, I don't know if he was actually angry with people at the roast, but he always looked it. So everybody's like, he's an asshole. It's like, well, yeah. you know, why bother doing it then? So out of all the roasts you've done, because you've done quite a few, which one would you say was your favorite to do? I mean, I think the Larry the Cable Guy one was great. And you were the the one who uh, was the, the roast. roast yeah, the roast yeah. master. Yeah. So that was great because I get to run things and you're pretty, you know, it, it's a lot of responsibility because it's hard, but also you get to, if somebody makes fun of you, you get to go up again and hit them. So that was good. Um, and also he's just a great guy. So that was fun. Um, one of my favorite things about that roast was I know you had Bill Engvall on your show. Yes, ma'am. Yep. And Bill couldn't make it to that, um, that roast. So I, he had sent a videotape so I said, right after the tape, I go, oh, wow, Larry the Cable Guy, you know you're famous when Bill Engvall <laughs> sent the tape. <laughs> I freaking love that. So it was really like, with Larry, you could just say anything. He's a good dude, he doesn't care. And also he's just, I don't know, when there's that warmth about a character, him or say for instance, like a Flavor Flav, like it's just fun, because they're gonna laugh at everything. They're not going to torture the other roasters. They're going to just be really cool. Jeff Foxworthy looked a little uneasy whenever people yeah, started to Jeff. kind of go, yeah. Well, Jeff has different, you know, he's much more, cons not conservative politically. I don't know anything about his politics, but he's conservative as a general, he's like a gentleman. Yeah. So he's not comfortable with all that talk. And I just always thought it was great that for his friends, he came out and did it instead of being like, oh no, I don't believe in that. And he was a good sport at his own roast, too. Oh, yeah, he was great. That roast was viewed by so many people because people forget, like, there's America other than New York and L.A. In comedy, forget that the world between exists. So it's really cool that he kind of appealed to all the people who were his fans. And they, oh, my God, they loved it. So now, Lisa, after comedy, what have you been up to? Uh, you have a podcast of your own that you're doing. And uh, tell us why, why you love it so much and uh, what it's about. Yeah, it's really weird because what happened was um, I decided to retire because I just, no, again, I noticed that I just didn't love the lifestyle. I never loved the lifestyle. The lifestyle has always been horrible. Yeah. Even if you you were in the kind of position I was, which is like high end playing theaters, not playing clubs, you're playing, you know, you're, you're flying in and out. You're always exhausted. It's theater, hotel, airport. That's all you see. It's not fun. But um, the stage stuff was fine. But I go, oh, if I continue this lifestyle much longer, people are going to sense I don't have, I'm not in it anymore. And I'm like, why is a secretary allowed to retire after 30 years? Why is a businessman allowed to, but a comic or an entertainer can't? And I'm like, well, I can. So I was smart enough. I was raised by depression era parents who taught me to save money and I live small, or actually I didn't always, but now I like living small. Um, and I was like, oh, you can leave. I'm like, oh, this is cool. 
So I wanted to, with dignity, go on Howard Stern and talk about it, which thankfully he said yes. And um, I read a book recently where they say it takes three successful tries to retire successfully, meaning just like you don't overdo or underdo. So at first I overdid it. Like I was doing little speaking things and I was doing this play and then this stage show and then this and that and coaching and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, I'm burnt out again. Okay, let's try again. So I finally think I got it right because I have discovered, as you can tell from you and I talking, there's nothing I enjoy more than talking about myself. And well, the only thing I enjoy more than talking about me is telling people how stupid they are. So I decided there are these two millennial comics, straight guys who are really good guys and have a lot of feelings. And I would overhear their conversations yeah, you know, when I would hang out with them and I'd be like, you guys are deep. This is a podcast. And I said, but you can talk about one issue a week and I get to come on and then read you the riot act, make fun of you and also help you in your journey through life. And they were like, oh my God, we're in. So we developed this podcast called Losers with a Dream, which by the way, is from a roast. I uh, took the name because I used to, I don't know if you remember, I used to make fun of the whole dais and then I'd yep. go, at a roast, I'd go, but enough about these losers with a dream. <laughs> let's, let's hit whoever. So I said, let's call it losers with a dream. I said, because we're all losers on this podcast, but we all have a dream. Like my loss is that I'm kind of like wasted my whole life just doing comedy. And now I have to develop friends and family. And my, that's my dream. I said, your dream is to be big in comedy and to find a wife and kids. I said, so let's every week do this podcast about an issue. Like this week we did fear of success. Two weeks ago we did vulnerability and we all ended up laughing, but then I made them give each other true compliments and not make fun of each other or themselves. And we're all crying. So it's a very emotional podcast, but really funny. And I just love that it kind of is new and it's about it's straight guys who actually have feelings. So it's very shocking to me that I like it so much. And that's why I'm like, wow, maybe retirement can be successful. I could do things that just are joyful and meaningful, but not a big deal. Like it's fun, not torture, which I always thought, you know, for, for something to be worthwhile, it has to be torturous, like comedy and flying around. It doesn't, it could just be yeah. simple. <clears throat> so yeah, it's a great podcast. I think your people would love it if they like me and if they like talking about bigger issues. Absolutely. I mean, you talk about retiring at the perfect age. I remember like Bob Barker was like 75 when he retired from the prices, right? Yeah. And so, I, often, I often look at those people and I wonder, do they are do they still have fun? Or I always go, oh God, how much money do you need? And then I go, well, maybe they just do love it that much. I just yeah. stopped loving it. And I can honestly say now, like when I do the podcast or when I look in my book to see what I have scheduled I'm like wow there's nothing I'd cross out there's nothing that I'm like oh my god I gotta go do this and that's a sure sign because for the last five years of comedy I was like oh I gotta fly here oh I gotta do that yeah so you just notice and that's the problem we don't notice our own lives so do people still I mean I want to ask you one more comedy sure. question do people uh still come up to you asking you to roast them at all I mean since that seems I mean, to be the yeah occasionally somebody will come up. I'm, I'm not as recognizable because, you know, I lost all the weight. Oh, yeah. kept off. I, you don't know, have different hair, but when they do, um, it's mostly just like, Hey man, you're the best. Oh my God, you're the best. And that feels good because I'm like, Oh, somebody remembers me. Like we all feel forgotten, you know? And, uh, occasionally they'll be like, dude, can you call me whatever word? And I'm more than happy to do that. Like I, there's no problem with me calling a wife on the phone and saying, hey, I'm with your husband. He thinks you're the C word. I mean, how could that not be fun? <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty much, uh, it's not insulting to me at all. I was just going to ask you, I mean, if there was an insult that you had for me that you could, as we... Uh... What, the fact that you have 13 listeners and want me to write a joke for you? <laughs> <laughs> how dare you? Go ask Bill Engvall that <laughs> Now, I love the insult because that's kind of what I was trying to do when I developed my <laughs> my personal uh, 
thing, like how to develop it. But because uh, that's just one thing that I love. I mean, being insulted, there's nothing better to me. It really does humble you. Well, you know, it's it's interesting. You almost can't project what you want versus what just comes out. So like with these two guys who I do the podcast with, Bo and Nick, they're both comics. And I just tell them, just be you and it will eventually be funny. It's like, it's, I, I get really mad at people uh, like when I'm watching them and I'm like, oh, you're clearly just trying to not be yourself and you're hiding yourself because I did it for so many years, you know? So we all hate what we, the mistakes we made. So, you know, if I, I'm on a podcast or developing a TV show or talking to you or whatever. I'm just going to be me. And it's more vulnerable too. It's harder because you're like, uh -oh, they can see me and then I'm actually not that great. And then I'm kind of boring and then I'm whatever yeah. people are, you know? So, Hey, just do you have fun with it. I'm glad that you enjoy it. Cause that's the big thing, dude. Like if we're not having fun, as people, and I don't mean fun, like it looks yeah, yeah. on Instagram. I just mean, if we're not coming home at the end of the day with that kind of little cute charged up feeling and that happiness, why bother? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I know that was you after doing it for 30 years. Yeah, man. It's like wild. I'm so glad that life sort of happened the way it did. Well, Lisa, I want to give one more plug to your uh, podcast. It's called Losers with a Dream, and, and uh, people can find it wherever podcasts are, Everywhere. right? Yes, our, our episodes are really deep, but only an hour long, and uh, they really get to the hardest stuff. But hey, sometimes I got to roast people on the podcast. I mean, <laughs> hey, this is, this is, some people deserve it, and sometimes these guys ask for it. Yeah, just like I did. Hey, why not, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Lisa, I am most appreciative to you for coming on to the podcast. And uh, I'm such a huge fan, like I said. And uh, again, thank you for doing what you did to Westboro, because that's something that's deep to my heart. Oh, thank you, my friend. We'll see you soon. And good luck with everything. Thank you. Okay, bye.